Good morning and welcome. I'm Jamie Muir, one of the leaders of the Beacon Church, and it's lovely to have you with us this morning, particularly if you're with us for the first time. I hope you really get blessed and built up by today's service. Well, here we are, January the 10th, 2021, and the beginning of our third lockdown. It's challenging, isn't it, being in this COVID crisis? You know, I'm not one for buying newspapers usually, but this morning I couldn't help noticing the headline of this paper. The weeks ahead will be the hardest yet, but the end is in sight. It reminded me of Hebrews 12, which is a lovely scripture that says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance the race marked out for us. At school, I was not one of the great sportsmen, but there was one sport in which I wasn't too bad, and that was the long distance running. Once a year in my school, there was horror of horrors, the race that I really dreaded, which was the entire school went on this race, 500, 600 boys uh, on this one race. And when I arrived at the school, I was told about this race by my brother, who was two years ahead of me. And uh, I just worried about it, didn't sleep the night before. And when I came to it, I was fueled on a mixture of complete fear and adrenaline and came 54th in the school. The next year, I felt I had to somehow beat that. And even more adrenaline and fear came 36th, the third year, 24th, the fourth year. By then I was house captain of running and I felt all eyes were on me. I had to really pull the, some miraculous thing out of the bag and I cracked. Um, I walked around the course with my uh, rather discouraging mates and uh, wearing a Stetson hat and cowboy boots on my feet and I came in the 500th. Yes, I was house captain of running at the time. My housemaster wasn't impressed, my headmaster was less impressed and I really damaged my reputation. I think I blew my chances of being a school captain or head head of house or whatever. It was damaging but I learned a very valuable lesson that is persevere, do not give up. Don't let peer pressure, the values of those around you, don't let exhaustion or fear or rebellion rise up in you. Focus your eyes. And the Bible says very specifically that we are to focus our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and the perfecter of our faith. Well, January the 10th, obviously it's the beginning of the year. Joanne and I, my wife and I, we try and go through the Bible in a year, every year, done this through most of our married life and it's really good. The last two or three years we've done Nicky Gumbel's The Bible in a Year and I noticed this year they're doing an express version, just 10 minutes a day I think it is, or uh, and then there's a youth version 13 to 18. If you've not done this, it's brilliant, do do it. I can't believe you'll get through the Bible in a year in 10 minutes, but Anyway, maybe that's over two years. This year, Joanne and I are actually doing something different. We're doing Martin Childsworth's Word Online. It's free, it's on the internet, it's 184 half hour sessions split into 14 series, and it's on Jesus, just him in the four gospels in chronological order. We are determined this year to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You know, as we do that, it, we will be looking at God because Hebrews 1 says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So you can see how important it is to focus on Jesus. And John 1, of course, says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus, the word, was God. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. As we focus on Jesus this year, as you and I focus on Jesus this year, we will be filled with light, and it will illuminate not only our path and give lamp, a lamp to our feet, but it will actually be a beacon of light to those around us. Let's pray that this year, our infectivity rate 
as Dave, one of my fellow elders, said, let our infectivity, our, our number, be greater than ever before. Let us infect people with Jesus Christ. See more and more people coming to Jesus as we focus on him in our lives and become more full of light. So let's pray. Father, we commit this service to you. Fill us again with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your word. Fill us with Jesus. We love you so much. Lord, come and have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy the service. I'll catch you at the end. God bless.
Let's spend some time in prayer. You know, it's such a privilege, isn't it? The Word of God tells us that we can boldly approach the throne of God to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So let's do that now. Let's really approach the throne of God and uh, ask God to pour out his grace on three situations. Firstly, let's pray for comfort for those who we know who are really struggling, who've had bereavements, who are scared of the COVID crisis. Secondly, let's pray for our town now that we've taken ownership of the Watergate Centre. And thirdly, let's pray for the world. So let's pray first of all and for those who need comfort. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Father, we are heartbroken by people who have passed away, who we know and love. Lord, you understand this. You see the big picture. And Lord, we just thank you that you have received those who've known you into that place of eternal joy and pleasure, Lord, by your right hand. We just thank you for the knowledge that those people are now safe with you if they've known you, Lord. And so we just pray Lord, for those who are in need of comfort right now because of loneliness, because of bereavement, because of anxiety. Lord, would you pour out your comfort? Lord, your word says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we're asking for a real visitation of your Holy Spirit to shed abroad the love of God into those people who feel so bereft and heartbroken and fearful at the moment. Come by the power of your spirit right now, Lord, and just enter every trembling heart. Lord, give them that overshadowing of God, or what C.T. Studd called the chloroform of God, God's comfort and presence. Lord, we just release that now by faith into those that we know and love who need comfort at the moment. And we pray now for our town, your word says in Isaiah 44, but now listen, Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I've chosen. This is what the Lord says, he who made you, he who formed you in the womb and he who will help you. 
Do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, Jeshur, in whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees beside flowing streams. Some will say, I belong to the Lord. Others will call themselves by the name of Jacob, and still others will write on their hand the Lord's and will take the name Israel. Lord, we just thank you for this promise, Lord, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit in these last days. And so, Lord, we're asking you, we're pleading with you, Lord, would you pour out your Spirit on our town? Lord, we just pray that people will be coming to Jesus, will be coming to the Lord as they get that conviction by the Holy Spirit, Lord, of your eternal kindness. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Lord, in your kindness, show them that they are not self-sufficient, that they need a saviour. So we're just praying, Holy Spirit, would you be poured out? And as you are poured out on this dry and thirsty land, we just pray that we would see children of God, new creations springing up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees beside flowing streams. Lord, just make our hearts like flowing streams. So we just pray those rivers of living will flow from our hearts. Give us grace and courage, Lord, to share the gospel with those we know, with our family, friends, neighbours and colleagues, in Jesus' name. Amen. And finally, Lord, we pray for our world. Remember Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? I have installed my king on Zion, upon my holy mountain. Lord, we cry out to you, Lord, for America, Lord, and for every nation of the world. Lord God, it seems that so many nations, Lord, have tried to live uh, separate and apart from Jesus in their hearts and lives. And Lord, we just pray you would come, Lord, and be enthroned, Lord, as King of kings and Lord of lords. Take your rightful place in the nations, Lord, but particularly at this time we remember America, Father. We just pray that people would return en masse to Jesus, Lord, not to human rulers or governors, but to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the one who is the Prince of Peace. So we just pray for peace to dominate, to rule and reign, Lord, in Washington and in that whole a nation of America. Lord, we entrust this to you, crying out for you to come, Lord, and be revealed in America, be revealed in our nation. Lord, let people return to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, our dear Lord and Saviour. And we pray these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. The Book of Nehemiah Nehemiah finds out through a messenger that his homeland is in ruins. Hundreds of years earlier, the Babylonians destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They tore down the temple and walls that protected the city and dragged the people away into captivity. Years went by with the Babylonians in charge until a powerful king in Persia named Cyrus attacked and defeated the Babylonians. As a result, Cyrus allowed the people of Israel to go back and rebuild their temple. Unfortunately, the Israelites once again turned their back and sinned against God. Meanwhile, King Cyrus dies and a new king is put into power. This new king boldly proclaims that there will never be a wall built around the city of Jerusalem again. It appears the Israelites have missed their window of opportunity. Nehemiah is the cupbearer to this king. Cupbearer meaning prime minister, bodyguard and second in command. Nehemiah hears of his people's plight and his heart breaks. So he takes a risk and asks the king if he can go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The hand of God was upon Nehemiah, so the king granted his request. And after five months, Nehemiah travels to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. When he gets there, he surveys the situation for three days and then makes a speech to the people of Jerusalem. The Book of Nehemiah The Words of Nehemiah, Son of Hakaliah In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, 
Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. Hello, here we are again. It's January. It's a new year. It's a new day dawning today. We've already had, what is it, nine days to forget all the resolutions that we've made or renewed this January. But I'm not going to be talking about resolutions per se, but right now 
we in Beacon have a special reason to look to the future. I'd be surprised if it's escaped anyone's attention that we now have a home of our own in the Bullring in Whitchurch. As I look back through my files, it's fascinating to see that in 2009, we had a very small office at the rear of the former Holly's Hotel in Chester Road. And ever since, we've been looking at potential properties. We've looked at two former churches, the Baptist Church in Green End in 2012, the Congregational Church in Doddington in 2013. We've looked at three former pubs, a formula am former ambulance station seven years ago, the old rectory, that was a fascinating place, and the Joyce Clocks site in 2014, the former youth club called Centre Northeast in Tesco's car park, and numerous shops, even a plot of land near to Sainsbury's, in total over 30 different sites. And now we own 5 Watergate Street, which provides by far the most spacious and versatile accommodation that we've ever looked at in Whitchurch. And as elders, we believe this is of God and that we've been allowed, as it were, to purchase it in order to fulfil his purposes. Everywhere else we've looked, our ideas, our plans, they've been frustrated, even though they seemed plausible at the time. The prolonged negotiations, the planning process, the legal requirements, yes, they, they were tortuous enough, but now the real world work starts. All our equipment has already been transferred from our old office to Watergate Street, and plans are being prepared to schedule alterations over several phases to make it into a welcoming environment suitable for worship, for youth, for community work. And we believe even the name is significant, Watergate. When we reflect back on the book of Nehemiah, we discover someone who was passionate about the Lord his God and providing the environment in which to worship and serve him. We find a man who is distressed that the city walls of Jerusalem lie in ruins. We find a man whose passion becomes the rebuilding of the wall and the rededication of the temple. We find a man who, for all his confidence and enthusiasm, is strongly opposed and ridiculed by some. And yet Nehemiah persevered. The first seven chapters of the book of Nehemiah deal with the process of rebuilding the walls and its completion, and recording the names of the people who returned from exile to Babylon. And then in the very last verse of chapter 7 we read, When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their town, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women and others who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. A little earlier, we had a reading from the opening of the book of Nehemiah, a prayer of confession on behalf of himself, on behalf of his family, and on behalf of the nation as a whole. 
I would suggest to you we're in not too dissimilar a place today. I would suggest that you and I, our families, we've all sinned. We can choose to confess that God was right when he said through Isaiah, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's Isaiah 53 verse 6. And then again in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The collective society in which we live may not wish to acknowledge that God is right, but they too have sinned and they fall short of the glory of God. How vital then that we, as Christians living in and around this town, should have the same sort of passion that Nehemiah had for things to change and for God's name to be glorified. All at the water gate, all the people listened to the reading of God's word. It is our prayer that people of this town and its surrounding villages will come to the water gate to hear the word of the Lord. Which is great. But, and it's a big but, we all know that the church is not a building. A building is all fine and dandy, as one of my kids would say, but of itself, a building will achieve nothing. A building has no life. It's just four walls and a roof. We all know that the church is the people. That's, that's you and me. We are the ones through whom God will build his church. We are the ones who bring life within those four walls. The task that Nehemiah embarked upon was fraught with challenges. In order to achieve a good result and quickly, he needed to engage the help and support of all the people who had returned from Babylon, as well as those who already lived in the city. Clearly, Nehemiah and his team were good organisers and managers. They assigned responsibilities to groups of people, mostly family groups, and every group came up trumps. The wall was completely restored in 52 days. But, 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 yes, each and every one of us can find reasons why we can't fully commit to rebuilding the wall. Do you think the people of Jerusalem didn't have their own priorities as well? Such as putting a secure roof over their own heads, like providing food for the family, like taking time out for rest and relaxation? Some of them would have been old. Some of them would have been nursing mothers. Some of them would have had ailments and infirmities. I would suggest they faced similar pressures to all of us today. With the best will in the world, I cannot see our walls being completed with, within 52 days, especially in the midst of covid epidemic, not least because we currently lack the financial resources. And in any case, as we all very well know, as I've stated clearly before, it's not just bricks and mortar that we're talking about here. We hope to be able to worship in that building and to provide services for our community in a fairly short period of time. I know many of you are raring to go, people who are frustrated about our lack of facilities in the past years, 
people who are frustrated with being locked down for so long and now for so much longer. But this project is one that will require buy-in from all of us as we seek to impact Whitchurch and its neighbouring villages with the love and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. After all, he came into the world to save sinners. That's us. That's you and me and all the people around us. Yes, we're back to square one when Nehemiah offered a prayer of confession. What better time than the beginning of a new year to offer ourselves again to the Lord, to become again those living sacrifices, giving our all to him, inviting him to refill us afresh with his Holy Spirit, to go out and preach the gospel to this town. Would you join me in doing that? Would you invite God to light the fire again in your heart? Would you call out afresh to God not to let your love grow cold? Would you plead with him not to allow your vision to die? Would you acknowledge once more that God knows your heart? He knows your thoughts and your deeds. Would you come humbly before your God? once more and dedicate your life anew to him? Would you join me? Let's pray. Father God, at the beginning of this new year, we offer your, our lives to you afresh. We ask you to invade our lives with your Holy Spirit, to give us a passion to go out to preach the word of God in our community, in whatever way we can. Lord, enable us to be effective witnesses for you in this place. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us this week. It's been a real pleasure, hasn't it? That was the first in a series on Nehemiah, building the walls of Jerusalem. In this season where we as a church are building the Watergate Centre, to be a place where God's word can be preached, where we can serve our community and where the presence and love of God can be felt in a very tangible way. Well, don't forget to build yourself up this week. Remember that word online or Bible in a year. Do everything you can to really nourish your spirit this week, this year. And then spur one another on to love and good deeds, as the, as the word of God says, by staying in fellowship through your connect groups. Remember, join us on a Saturday morning at 8.30 for our Zoom prayer meetings. And join us after this service at 11.30 for fellowship, where if there's enough of us, we'll break into our breakout rooms and just spend a little while just chatting and fellowshipping. It would be lovely to see you. Thank you again for joining us. Hope to see you next week. Have a brilliant week. God bless.